The following conversation is with Ryan Selkis. Ryan is the founder of Masari. In this conversation, we talk about GBTC's attempt to convert to an ETF. We talk crypto regulation, the contagion in the market, and many more other topics. I really enjoyed this conversation with Ryan, and I hope that you guys enjoy it as well. Don't forget that these episodes are brought to you by FTX US. They've got cheap fees, sometimes as much as 85% cheaper than their competitors. You can click on the link in the description to go learn more about FTX. Let's get into this episode with Ryan. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm very excited to talk to Ryan. Ryan, what's going on, man? Good to see you, man. I feel uh, underdressed. It's, it's the first time I've ever seen you in a suit and tie all the time. It's, well, it's, it's purely a new podcast. Well, listen, this is uh, my bear market costume. I wore this yes. during the 2008, 2019 bear market, defeated that bad boy. And so I figured we could use some help and I'm going to wear too. this uh, whether I want to or not. I promise everyone I would wear it until the bear market's over. So we need to turn this bad boy around uh, so I can stop wearing it. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, there's a ton of stuff for us to talk about. Maybe we can start with uh, GBTC and their uh, hope to be converted to a ETF. Uh, they were denied in their most recent ETF application by the SEC and within hours turned around and sued the SEC. What is your general read on the situation and what do you think their prospects are uh, going to court uh, in terms of actually being successful with this lawsuit? I actually think that their prospects are pretty good. But, uh, you know, before we get into all that, I think we have to talk about GBTC, what it is, how it works, um, the, the havoc that is created in the market and um, the SEC is really – uh, indefensible position around its potential conversion to an ETF. So it basically, Grayscale is the largest asset manager on crypto. They have a, a set of passive funds that track Bitcoin, Ether, or some of the other top assets. And then they have a couple that are baskets of assets, you know, kind of like a top 10 um, crypto asset in, index. But the big one is GBTC and then to a slightly you know, lesser extent, their ETH product. And these products have come to market and basically started trading OTC, not actual ETFs, but OTC through this loophole in securities law that essentially allows them to raise money from private investors. And then after a six month holding period, those investors can sell the shares that represent the assets in the underlying trust uh, on the open market. And the way that an ETF works is you can continuously create and redeem baskets of shares that represent the interest in the underlying trust. So if for whatever reason, the share price deviates from the underlying spot price of the commodity that's held in the trust, you have brokers that are incentivized to make the market and basically arbitrage away those differences. So if the spot price is, uh, is higher than the price per share, um, you're going to redeem shares and just convert to the underlying asset and vice versa, right? If the share price is higher, you're going to want to sell those shares um, and then use that to create, you know, uh, more, more assets in the trust. And, and so you have this continuous feedback loop that keeps the spot price of the underlying ETF um, relatively close and, and in line with uh, what the price of the underlying commodity is. That's how traditional ETFs work. Now, Grayscale's products don't do that because it's weird loophole. So what does that mean? Well, it's created this dynamic where historically for a long time, the shares that traded on the OTC markets were at a premium to the underlying spot price. And the reason was there was a lot more demand for shares from different vehicles, either retail investors that wanted in their 401k or institutional investors that didn't really have any other access. And um, up until early last year, those shares traded at a premium. February last year, the trade reversed, it trades at a, a discount now. And, and now the discount's actually close to 30%. But again, because this is not an ETF, that's a one-way ticket. And the investors that hold the shares cannot redeem these shares. They can only get liquidity through the OTC market. So you don't really have a path to closing this gap. And what this has done is it's basically created $6 billion worth of capital impairment for the investors in the trust and these publicly traded shares with no path to actually recouping the assets that are in the trust as you would with an ETF. And this collateral, this trade was what Three Arrows Capital, BlockFi, a number of other big counterparties ultimately got caught in and created a bunch of the losses and, and some of this cascading effect that we've seen in the crypto markets with some of the uh, illiquidity and insolvency issues at, at some of the big investors. It was a synthetic trade that went sour and now everybody's trying to unwind these positions. So. The issue with the Grayscale um, 
ETF conversion and the fact that it was rejected again by the SEC is the SEC is basically saying, well, you know, the Bitcoin mar markets aren't uh, fully surveillable and there's no kind of shared surveillance agreements between international exchanges. So we can't guarantee that the market's not manipulated. So we're not going to apply, uh, we're not going to approve this ETF conversion. The problem is investors already have access to this thing and they're hurting to the tune of $6 billion. So I think if you look at that fact alone, plus the fact that the SEC approved futures uh, based ETFs six months ago, you have a dynamic where um, the SEC doesn't really have a good leg to stand on because futures are a derivative of the spot market. And those are inferior products that were approved late last year. And then you've also got this consumer protection issue. So um, short of an ETF conversion, it does look like the SEC is basically engaged in hostage taking and is waiting until they have full oversight and surveillance rights of the underlying crypto markets in the US before they act. Um, now that's kind of between the lines, but I, I think that's you know ho hopefully a good uh, two minute or, or three minute synopsis of, of what's otherwise a really complicated product for most people to wrap their heads around. If GBTC was being managed by a Wall Street bank, do you think that it would already have been converted? Like, is this a crypto company specific issue and it's less about the product or is it about the product and not so much the company behind it? I think it's a little bit of both, to be honest. I mean, it's it's tough to prove uh, that this is you know the reason that, uh, that this product you know has has not been approved. I, I think it's uh, really much more the case that the SEC doesn't want to reward cleverness and uh, and and you know a, a product that basically try to route around them by taking advantage of this loophole to get to the public markets, even though it's not an ETF. Um, and, and even more importantly, I think it's about jurisdiction and it's about the SEC expanding its overreach to include the likes of Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, the other US-based exchanges. And until they get that regulatory authority, what they're going to say is, how can we approve this in good conscience when we can't actually uh, guarantee to investors that we have a good handle on the integrity of the underlying markets, whose prices we rely on for this product, um, and in, until you know, there's some oversight of the exchanges themselves that provide the reference rates that feed these products and, and, and the underlying share price, um, we're just not going to do it, right? So it's it's very black and white. Um, I think based on a technicality um, and, and based on the fact that they're basically waiting to uh, expand their authority and, and get you know, additional powers from Congress. You've been around for quite a while. Uh, you've told me the story previously uh, of you tweeting out um, and kind of sharing the information about Mt. Gox when that failed. Uh, mm -hmm. There's been a number of companies, uh, some more painful than others, uh, who are going through similar types of situations, whether, you know, it's just, uh, hey, they're having stress induced by some of the GBTC and 3AC stuff. Uh, some of them are actually shutting down withdrawals. Uh, some of them look to have been engaged in uh, quite nefarious or, or bad acting, uh, you know, kind of situations. How bad is the current crop of this kind of chaos compared to Mt. Gox when uh, when you first came across it? I think it's arguably worse. You know, Mt. Gox, most people in the industry at the time knew that it was a shitty exchange, right? Uh, and, and it had already had a number of security issues. It was just the largest by virtue of being the first, right? And, and that creates a lot of stickiness because that's where the, the majority of liquidity was. Um, but you already had started to see some investors move away from Mt. Gox and, and to exchanges like Bitstamp. And, and there was a couple of others at the time. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Mt. Gox issue was one of technical incompetence and um, and theft, right? Um, because they had poor, you know, kind of risk control, security controls in terms of how they custodied assets. The, the reason I say that this is arguably worse is because of the contagion that uh, has been created by fraud and poor risk controls, um, and and by lending in particular, right? So, you know, with Mt. Gox, it was that the funds were stolen with. Uh, all of the cascading failures that we've seen uh, more recently, it was due to leverage and margin calls and a bunch of centralized counterparties that were, um, you know, I don't want to say gambling. I think gambling is a strong word in, in some of these cases, but they were they were essentially speculating um, with uh, with customer reserves and, and making uh, high interest rate markets, um, but not really having a good handle on the true risks at their counterparties. So um, you created a series of insolvencies. And, and I think that there's a big difference between um, 
when, you know, first of all, time, right? Nine years ago or, or eight years ago when, when Mt. Gox went under, uh, the, the industry was just significantly smaller and, and under the radar from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and, you know, you, you kind of fast forward to today, this is not something that was, you know, contained to uh, just a, a few bucket shops or, you know, kind of poorly managed operations. It really has hit a lot of the blue chip names in the industry um, and, uh, and a lot of multi-billion dollar um, companies or investors have, have, have been impacted uh, pretty significantly. So um, I think, you know, Mt. Gox, it was kind of like a, an isolated incident. Um, it was terrible, right? It was it was a huge chunk of the yeah, outstanding supply and, and, and it hurt a lot of investors. It took a, a long, long time uh, for that to make its way through the courts. But um, it was a single entity uh, versus this, you know, kind of ripple effect that we've seen uh, with Three Arrows Capital and 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 you know some of that the result of, of the bad collateral that Three Arrows was subject to with with uh, GBTC, the other the other issue is this is impacting a lot of Western players. You know, Mt. Gox was uh, you know for uh, no matter how you slice it, I mean, bit out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. It was you know uh, it was the big Japanese exchange. The Western you know kind of leaders thought, oh well, Bitstamp's based in Europe, and we've got Coinbase and Kraken in the U.S. So you know there was Western alternatives, um, and from uh, I think just a, a top of mind standpoint, most of the regulators uh, in the West just kind of looked at this and said, okay, you know we have to have guardrails for the um, the American and, and kind of European led businesses to make sure that stuff like this can't happen, and all of those entities are in fact regulated, but you know it wasn't as catastrophic as maybe you know it, it, it was in Japan, even though many U.S. customers were um, were exposed. What is your expectation for changes in regulation or disclosures coming out of uh, kind of all of the last couple of weeks and, and the chaos mm -hmm. in the crypto market? I, I think that the centralized players are underregulated. Now, the, the 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 issue here is we need to be very careful about what works and what doesn't, and kind of where the dividing line should be, because when it comes to the decentralized lending protocols, you could watch some of these liquidations happen on chain in real time as they were happening uh, during the liquidity crisis a couple of weeks ago as the prices were, were you know, getting uh, getting drawn down. And um, and that's painful for whoever's taking out a margin position on chain, but the protocols worked, right? And I, I think some of that is, is kind of missing here. The real issues were in the centralized uh, black boxes that sat on top of this and, and were basically, you know, holding themselves out to be these uh, these really robust uh, you know, banks with good risk controls and 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 you know, really strong products that were run by professional teams, when in reality you know they're basically you know under reserved banks with poor risk controls. Even if they were defrauded, you know some of these companies to have fifty percent of your outstanding loan book be with one counterparty. I mean that's just piss poor risk management, right? There's there's no other way to 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 slice it. No matter how big Three Arrows was uh, in, in in terms of you know its its import as an industry player, so I think that's um, that's one of the things that's going to be hard. That's going to be a bell that can't get unrung, right? And and I, I think that um, regulating centralized entities um, is important. And in fact, most people that are serious in the industry talk about the need to regulate the centralized entities here that are handling customer funds that are making markets and that are facilitating lending or exchange, right? I, I don't know anyone serious that's arguing against that. What the issue is going to be is where do we draw the line and can we ensure that some of the open protocols and peer-to-peer -peer financial activity, you know, like on-chain lending or like decentralized exchange is, is not touched and it's, it's you know, fought for and vigorously defended so it's not thrown out with the bathwater um, when, we, when we start to see some more stringent regulations on the centralized entities. Um, and if we do our jobs right, you know, kind of collectively as an industry, I think that's where we'll end up where the peer-to-peer -peer will um, will be protected uh, and the centralized entities that look like banks or regulated like banks, centralized exchanges that operate like New York Stock Exchange and, and you know, NASDAQ, they're, they're regulated as such. Um, and, you know, that'll ultimately usher in the, the next you know, wave of growth and institutional adoption. So I think everybody wins if we can get that balance right. Talk about the difference between the centralized platforms and the decentralized uh, protocols or, or platforms and kind of how their performance has differed throughout all of this. Well, I mean, it's pretty simple. The decentralized platforms worked and, and you didn't have the ability to shut down user withdrawals, right? Uh, it, you know, some of these um, collateralized vaults, if they were at risk or, or you know, they were not um, topped up with additional collateral, they did 
you know, get liquidated, but they were liquidated programmatically according to the rules of the smart contracts as they were written. Um, you contrast that with the centralized uh, lenders and they just straight up pause withdrawals because they, they were insolvent or close to insolvent and, and they had to um, basically pause operations. This happened with Celsius, this happened with Voyager. Um, and I'd imagine we're not totally out of the woods just yet. There's probably some other companies that are on the brink right now in terms of uh, in, insolvency or, or trying to limit withdrawals and, and make sure that this doesn't cascade further. But um, hopefully the worst, the very worst is over. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, another couple of uh, kind of final dying breaths of this particular liquidity crisis. You, given your kind of long uh, history in the uh, Bitcoin and crypto industry uh, have seen all forms of Bitcoin maximalism. And there appears to be a great debate. Uh, Is Bitcoin maximalism good? Is it bad? Is it the same it used to be? What's your take on uh, Bitcoin maximalism and many of the people who uh, kind of are carrying that torch forward uh, today? Um, The majority of my investment portfolio uh, I'd say is is Bitcoin and then my own company, right? So you know when, when I when I say what I say next, you know I, I'd, I'd hope that people keep this in mind. But um, I think Bitcoin maximalism is about as close to brain cancer um, as we have, uh, short of actual brain cancer. And I, I think maximalism of all types is um, is pretty dangerous, uh, just in terms of like what you're willing to fall for and 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 how closed off to opportunities you could be. I don't think Bitcoin maximalism is is any different from any other sort of fanaticism, whether it's political or religious or, you know, people that are, are just unhealthily, you know, obsessed with, with anything that catches their interest. Um, I understand the arguments for Bitcoin and its uniqueness as an asset and as a network, um, but not that it's the only interesting uh, asset and network that is leveraging blockchains and uh, some of the cryptography that was first written about in Satoshi's white paper uh, in, in 2008, right? So I think that's where you can draw the distinction. And I think, you know, you're probably alluding to Nick Carter and, and, and the drama with, uh, with, with Nick. I mean, Nick is one of the smartest, um, longest term proponents for Bitcoin and one of the best evangelists for Bitcoin and, and, and some of its technical underpinnings out there. Um, and his sin was uh, being open-minded enough to understand other networks and other opportunities within the crypto sphere. So, you know, he was he was routinely, you know, uh, chastised and and uh, just wrecked online for his, uh, you know, his, his supposed betrayal, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't know what purity test is used. I always use opportunities like this in little sound bites, like, you know, Bitcoin maximalism is brain cancer, um, to just like retweet and then block uh, every single person uh, that you know is is going to come out of the woodwork and uh, and attack because of it, uh, and it just creates a better experience for me online. So I I, I kind of routinely put chum in the water and um, and make sure that I don't have to hear from those people because I just don't think that you're you're going to get anywhere if um, if that's your your narrow worldview um, and uh, and kind of the way that you're going to engage uh, with uh, with critics. So it, is it fair to uh, summarize your thought process as like it is a form of extremism and extremism, whether it's in politics or anywhere else, is not something that you think is healthy? Is that like a fair characterization? Well, it's not only unhealthy. I just think it's a sign of, of you know, emotional and mental weakness uh, to, to not be able to entertain, you know, multiple thoughts at the same time or, or, or understand, that, you know, any any kind of nuanced views towards um innovation and 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 tech right i mean it's 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 literally i I mean it's it's just it's crazy to me that um you have some people that look at an invention from 13 years ago and now it's a it's like a sacred text um instead of a breakthrough innovation of which we will have many others deployed using this same kind of underpinning technology Um, so whether it's you know ZK proofs and all the innovation that's happening around Zcash, I don't know if Zcash is going to win, but ZK proofs and, and zero knowledge transactions and, and this privacy preserving feature um, that has been you know, really popularized because of the investment around ZK and in, in crypto, you know that's going to be applied in, in many different you know, use cases outside of just money. Um, so you know what does that sit on other blockchains? Does it sit in other kind of non blockchain applications? I think the answer is yes to both. But um, Bitcoin is not necessarily going to be the network that incorporates 
zero knowledge proofs before any other. So right off the bat, you're basically excluding one of the most interesting cutting edge areas of cryptography out there because you've got this, you know, borderline religious you know, fanaticism around um, the, the holy scripture of Satoshi from 13 years ago. It's just, I mean, it, it's absurd on its face to basically anybody um, that uh, that really kind of <laughs> just looks at, at, at the state of discourse on crypto Twitter. But I, I think that's not really an accurate indication of where most people's heads are, even um, crypto skeptics and Bitcoin bulls, right? Most most people that fall into that camp are probably more similar to, to me. And I think you, Pump, where you're open-minded to everything, you've got pretty strong conviction around one particular asset and its staying power, and everything else is a little bit more experimental with lots of upside, but a, a number of unproven variables that, um, that will be de-risked over time. Yeah, I don't even have a huge problem with people who uh, generally believe what they're saying and then their actions like support it. I think the part that screams uh, kind of, um, I don't know, unsustainable or, or just comical is the hypocrisy. Like there are certain people who uh, will yell and scream and kind of uh, do the equivalent of virtue signaling around a certain set of ideals. Uh, and then you look at whether it's the things that they build or the companies that they run or whatever. And you're like, you're literally doing the exact opposite of what uh, you're accusing other people of doing or, or that you're like projecting on other folks. And so I tend to agree with you that um, just, you know, look at politics as an example, like extreme left, extreme right, both is like very unhealthy. Uh, and so I tend to think that um, one of the most interesting data points in all of the crypto industry, whether people like it or not, uh, is that 87% of Bitcoiners hold other assets. And there's a bunch of folks who think that that number will uh, go down over time. Uh, there's a lot of folks who tend to think that number is going to go up over time. But it used to be 100% of Bitcoiners held 100% of Bitcoin, right? Like it was only Bitcoin. Um, and that's changed. And now what we don't know in that data, which I think is a very fair critique of the data, is it like 87% of people have Bitcoin plus like some stable coins? And where do stable coins fall into the whole thing, right? Like are stable coins considered altcoins and therefore they're bad? Uh, or are they okay because they help people get into Bitcoin? And I don't necessarily have like a, a strong opinion in either way, but like now you get into like the nuance as you as you stated. And I think that the deeper you get into the conversation, the more obvious like a black and white view of the world is nearly impossible to overlay here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the stable coin is one example, but the other thing is look at DeFi for instance. Um, if you are running a decentralized exchange like Uniswap, and you know that the market makers make fees and the protocol could hypothetically make a small fee per transaction, even if it's one basis point, for instance, then ultimately um, there's ways to mutualize um, uh, those revenues and, and those economics across everyone that's participating you know, across the network. Um, and that's essentially what, what I think a lot of DeFi protocols will be at scale. They'll be user-owned networks um, where you know the traders are the same as the you know quote unquote equity holders um, are the same as, as kind of the market makers, right? So it's 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 incentive alignment and it's um, ownership interest uh, on behalf of the market participants themselves. That's really interesting, and you can apply that to any of the other uh, kind of emerging application areas. If there is a fundamental use case that is economically valuable and people are willing to pay for that on chain. Uh, space, those those ledger entries, the block space, um, then ultimately anyone that's involved with that network will be able to um, uh, you know, take out some of the fees uh, that, that are used to process those transactions. So it's it's no different from you know, how a number of uh, consortia work right now in, in traditional finance. Um, it's just uh, it's just new and, and it moves a hell of a lot faster because uh, you're talking about open source code instead of you know, six-year-old code that was written uh, in in you know ancient programming languages that basically no longer exist uh, on on behalf of the big banks and and you know, interchange uh, operators. So, um, I think that's going to be true for all sorts of assets, right? I know you spoke more about NFTs on on your you know, podcast. Do I think that you know uh, digital art should be worth you know ten dollars or a hundred thousand? Well, a it depends on the piece, and b I don't know because that's not really my jam. But um, I do know that there's a market for art and digital art, so you know, NFTs could, could be useful in that context. And then NFTs as a data wrapper could be useful far beyond that. But um, again, a lot of these things 
um, you know that they could be interesting. It's how do we get there? That is the, the big open question for the industry. And we might go through another period of consolidation where we see Bitcoin dominance back above you know, 80%, maybe even 90%. I doubt that happens, but maybe we could because that is the application as the strongest product market fit right now. Um, but that's not to say that everything will go to zero except for Bitcoin. Obviously that's false. And we know it's false because it's already been proven false. And there hasn't really been strong evidence to support that that everything else is going to zero, much to the chagrin and uh, I think frustration of, of the toxic uh, Bitcoin maximalist crowd. One of the uh, themes that I think is really interesting because you running Masari obviously are very aware of uh, so much of the non-Bitcoin world. What are people building? What's working? What's not working? What did they hope is the, the kind of promise of it. Um, and it seems like now with uh, the Lightning Network uh, and then their proposal for Tarot on top of Lightning from Lightning Labs, uh, that the same ideas feel to be in both kind of communities or ecosystems like the Bitcoin and non-Bitcoin uh, side of the house. How do you evaluate Lightning Network's progress or the uh, Terra proposal in light of what you're seeing in the rest of the market? Like, are these things just echo chambers for the Bitcoin world and they think that they're really um, kind of highly adopted and growing fast, but in your experience, they aren't compared to other things? Or is there a strong argument there that that those things are actually becoming more popular? I, I think Lightning is really interesting, um, but it hasn't scaled anywhere near as quickly uh, as stable coins on Ethereum, for instance. That's not an indictment of lightning and its potential. It's just a it's a, a factual state of, of affairs and where the industry is right now and where the tech is. Um, it's also factual to just say that it is uh, orders of magnitude easier to build on Ethereum um, and actually even on on you know, new emerging uh, stacks like Solana than it is to build on the Bitcoin um, stack for if you're a developer thinking about a new application. So um, these are just raw numbers, right? So you can get people to debate about the security model underpinning the, the blockchains themselves or about you know, what's coming next when it comes to extensibility of the Bitcoin platform and you need to build on a really robust foundation. I, I think yeah, those are arguments to be had, but in terms of where we are today, in terms of capital, in terms of uh, human capital and, and, and brain power, most of the interest is still on emerging layer one protocols that are you know, a little bit more complete in terms of the, the functionality and the, and the application they support, like Ethereum and, uh, and some of the other so, so-called L1s. Um, it's just not happening at the same speed or scale on Bitcoin yet. Um, maybe that maybe that changes, um, but I think that uh, the, the, the sheer number uh, of people and, and kind of the caliber of talent that are building outside of Lightning versus you know, within the Bitcoin community, it's it's pretty stark and uh, and it's it's not in the favor of the uh, Bitcoin zealots right now. If you just look at the raw numbers, um, I know that you recently heard uh, the All In podcast. Uh, I usually listen to it, but I have not seen uh, the one from last week. Uh, I saw you tweeting saying that uh, you disagreed with their analysis of crypto. So maybe lay out what were their arguments as you understood them, and then what do you agree or disagree with uh, from uh, from that episode. Well, you know, you don't have anyone on that show that's actually like deep into crypto. Uh, I think you, you have a, a few guys that are uh, kind of armchair quarterbacks. They, they haven't really done the work and kind of gotten deep here. Um, and that's fine, right? Like, I, and first of all, like I'm a huge fan. I went down to their summit and I, I think those guys are, are super sharp. As like an entrepreneur and an investor, like I've gotten so much out of, of uh, listening to a lot of their stuff just on macro and, and, and when you think about startup investing. Um, but they just they don't really spend much time in crypto, so that's kind of understandable. Um, and I was giving them a little bit of a hard time because um, uh, yeah, Chamath, uh, who I know you've had uh, on your shows in the past, he's brilliant, and he did give a good market structure breakdown of what happened and, and how some of these lenders went bust and, and all the shenanigans in terms of you know, the high interest rate loans that people were, were speculating with in DeFi and, and how some of these insolvency issues came uh, to the fore. But I think they, they conflated uh, the centralized with the decentralized, number one. They don't really understand the policy issues um, and the fact that uh, right now we're operating in no man's land and no one in the right line within crypto is saying that we shouldn't be regulated, right? It's that decentralized protocols should not be regulated the same as centralized institutions. And why don't you give us a little bit of clarity on what the rules of engagement are so we can safely integrate these centralized financial um, institutions and, and products 
into the broader you know financial ecosystem um and 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 that is not a like trivial mix up or or uh or, or distinction right you, you're on one hand talking about an industry that has been spending a lot of time collectively on policy engagement and trying to make sure that we have some good um we make some good headway and, and we can solve some of these structural issues because we think it's in the long-term best interest not only of, of the industry but all the users and, and potential beneficiaries of this tech um with just some of the carte blanche statements of you know everything's grift and i haven't seen any in interesting use cases and you know so on and so forth when you know the reality is like i, I said a few minutes ago all of the on-chain protocols that facilitate lending that facilitate decentralized exchange uh, and, and the like they operated just fine it was all the black box quasi centralized slash you know fully centralized you know black boxes that were um operating in the in the gray area and, and ultimately should be um should be shut down they should fail um and they should face you know customer repercussions and lawsuits if they're being irresponsible to customer funds right that's uh the, the, i think what i took exception with is no one in the industry that has any credibility or seriousness whatsoever disagrees that the last couple of months were a huge black eye and a bunch of people screwed up in some cases should be going to jail for fraud, it looks like. Um, but this wouldn't necessarily happen if we could get any momentum whatsoever on the regulatory side. Uh, so I, I think painting the entire industry and all of its participants with a, with a broad brush, it's just, you know, it's, it's a lack of sophistication. And, and generally that's to be expected from people that don't spend a lot of time here, but um, I was having fun on Twitter and, and poking the hornet's nest as you know I do. I know that I'm sure that they actually uh, would agree, right? I mean, just given uh, kind of who they are and, and hearing uh, them talk about a lot of this stuff of like, they're just talking about it. It's easy to talk in generalities. And then if you really sat down and have a 30 minute conversation with them, there may be more nuance to it. Uh, so it's always hard, right? But but I think to your point about like the nuance is really important uh, is, a, is a fair one. Um, do you think that... Uh, the traditional venture capitalists, not necessarily those uh, four individuals, but just in general, will we see them pull back from investing in crypto now that asset prices have come down and uh, and they'll kind of go away? Or do you anticipate that you'll still have kind of the crypto native uh, investors, plus you'll have a lot of those uh, non-crypto native investors sticking around and continuing to invest over the coming years? I think the variance is going to be huge um, between firms. So you're going to have some firms uh, that are run, you know, and and the partnerships are uh, full of a bunch of crypto skeptics that are saying, I told you so, and, and basically just ceasing operations. You'll have uh, others that are more open-minded and thinking about this as an entry point and saying, hey, how do we invest in infrastructure companies? We're in like the next installation phase. We're going to be able to get, get good entry prices into good companies. And, and businesses that are going to be around for this next cycle when and maybe solving problems that are addressing the uh, the, the um, institutional adoption and kind of mainstream uh, adoption problems. And then you're going to have some that are looking um, at this on the token side and they're saying, well, we missed the last wave, but now is the opportunity, now is the time for us to go in and look at all these assets that are now down 90 95, maybe even 99%, which of these protocols actually have value capture mechanisms and real fundamentals behind them? Because there's going to be so much mispricing in this middle market of assets. Um, it's insane and it, it presents a, a, a ton of opportunities. So you think about assets number, you know, like 25 through 300. Forget about the top 25. I don't necessarily think that this is true, but let's assume that the top 25 are, are, are super efficient and there's a lot of information symmetry so people know what they're doing and, and how to think about these um as uh, as relative allocations once you go past that you know when, once you drop down past a billion dollars of, of market capitalization in in you know research coverage drops um general you know kind of awareness uh, of, of these assets and how they work and other communities operate drops so you'll have um investors that are willing to roll up their sleeves get really really interesting insights and, and kind of a proprietary edge um making this middle market uh more efficient and um, and actually, you know, one of our star analysts, uh, Ryan Watkins, just left um, uh, a few months ago to start a company called Pangea, and, and their their focus is to you know kind of take this approach, do the work, and think about the the middle market liquid stuff that's just fundamentally mispriced. If you look at the underlying kind of you know value of, of the protocols or you know what they anticipate are, are going to be the, the value capture mechanisms long term, um, it's it's you know it couldn't be more different. And I think the um, 
the seed stage is going to continue to hold up well because people think about crypto as like one of the frontiers that is going to be fundamentally interesting, like mobile was 10 years ago and, and like uh, like the internet was you know, 10 years before that. So um, we got a lot of uh, we had a lot of room left to run and there's a lot of dry powder that's sitting on the sidelines ready to be deployed. It's just a matter of uh, really when do people get comfortable that the bottom's in and, and when the macro situation settled down a little bit. And then when you start to look at uh, a lot of the fundraising that occurred up until, I don't know, 2017 maybe, it was either Bitcoin related and equity, uh, you know, kind of structured. We then got the boom of ICOs uh, and that kind of swept uh, all of the fundraising uh, wind. Now, what are you seeing on the ground? How are people funding these efforts? Are they funding them through, you know, some variation of like ICO slash like token sale? Uh, are they just doing equity deals with like token warrant? Like what, like what is happening now? I think the good news is that a lot of people already raised, right? So they're, they're, they're ready to deploy. Um, and, you know, the, the companies that are, are having success raising right now are either at the seed stage um, and you know, just going from zero to one, and, and you know, have really high potential ideas that, that and good teams that people are excited about, um, or uh, they're they're somewhere on the infrastructure side of things. Um, so you know, what's going to be a good directional bet on the industry? Um, not necessarily you know um, taking massive you know uh, at risk bets of hundred million dollar you know billion dollar plus um, token networks when it's still unclear how much. Um, those values are going to wane and, and how much more bleeding there is um, because we just haven't seen a bottom generally uh, in, in, in the macro backdrop and in tech in general. So it's uh, it's going to be a lot easier to just uh, price those private rounds, uh, maybe with, to your point, like token warrants uh, and to the extent that there's a, a token that's released by the team at some point in the future. Um, but I'd say um, private placements or private kind of token purchases from big venture firms, I would, that's going to grind to a halt for sure. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, crypto and politics. Uh, you have, uh, I think at one point even said that you might run for an office. You have been uh, very quiet, no thoughts whatsoever when it comes to politicians uh, or regulators for that uh, uh, um, on the internet. What's your thought right now and current the current you know kind of position of crypto when it comes to the political landscape in America? I think everything has been reset the last quarter. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, there's a few things that happened in the in the last quarter. If you'd asked me at the end of March, where are we? I'd say we're in a pretty good position because it looks like Republicans um, are going to retake Congress, and so you'll have divided power, which will kind of grind the worst elements uh, potentially of, of, of uh, legislation down to a halt. Um, and then uh, you also have the dynamic where we are starting, getting, starting to get more informed um, uh, champions on the left and, and that progressive base. That's going to be really important so that this remains a bipartisan effort when we do think about more proactive legislation, right? So first is you know, put sand in the gears to make sure that the worst case scenario doesn't play out. And once there's a balance of power, now you have some really smart champions on both sides. Hey, what can we hash out as, as an agreement? But there's a few things that happened in the last quarter that I think threw everything off. One is just um, you know the three arrows capital situation, the Luna situation, like all these cascading failures um, and, and the black eye that that's given uh, the industry and, and the fact that a lot of customers have lost funds. And you're, start, you're gonna start to hear more you know, uh, like horror stories about people losing their life savings and, and just like terrible, right? Um, it, it's it's bad in general, but it's it's certainly bad also um, from a, a political optics standpoint. Um, and then you've got um, everything that's going on socially, right? So everything out of the Supreme Court right now and and just general impression that um, uh, there there's going to be social issues that start to drive the midterms. Um, if it was just about the economy and, you know, kind of the, the direction that things are, are, are heading, um, in the macro uh, backdrop with inflation and, and, and potential recessionary forces, you, know, you can think that we're going to have divided government in November. Now that's not at all you know, quite so obvious. So um, we'll see. I, I mean, I'm uh, I'm net bullish still, uh, and I think that the engagement efforts um, from from the big kind of crypto policy groups uh, have, have started to bear fruit. 
and um, and we're going to have some really thoughtful discussions uh, with the new Congress. Realistically, nothing's going to happen from a legislative standpoint until there's a new Congress sworn in next January. The meantime, it's going to be really about fighting some of these regulatory battles that come from the Biden executive order um, that was uh, released a few months ago. So we'll see. Um, I think uh, the battlegrounds are going to be around the right to private transactions, the right to kind of peer-to-peer -peer commerce. And a bunch of those are going to go to the Supreme Court, which regardless of your opinion on social issues is probably a net positive for crypto as an industry, because um, they're going to be, uh, I think, much more likely to look at some of the Fourth and First Amendment issues uh, that are, are you know, laid out in front of them when it comes to crypto. When we think about Masari, the uh, last update I think I got was at the turn of the year. What is the, uh, the mid-year update and where can people go to, uh, to check out some of that work? We've got a lot coming out uh, throughout the, the third quarter, the second half of the year. We've got uh, our main net conference where we'll have uh, about 4,000 people in New York. We're going to have a few big product releases and, and other you know, kind of major announcements there. Um, you can go to Masari.io. We've got a full suite of analytics tools, research, uh, and, uh, and asset diligence tools for, uh, for individuals and enterprises alike. Most of our um, business is, is you're really focused on enterprise B2B, but we offer a ton of you know, free resources as well as uh, both our top of the funnel and, and a you know, quasi public service. So um, happy to uh, have people connect with me on Twitter at two bit idiots and uh, certainly happy to answer uh, other questions about some of the opportunities to work uh, with us as a company and uh, and hopefully you know help some of these new institutions that are entering the fray uh, get smarter on crypto. Two bit idiot still is one of the best Twitter handles on the entire website. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Um, as someone said to me when I told them that you were coming on, they said, oh, he has very, uh, what did they say? They, he has very mainstream views. And then they <laughs> laughed and I was like, yes, that's why I want to talk to him is he, he, he continues to share, uh, a, a thought process that I actually think is, uh, is really important because what, if there's one thing that we've seen over the last eight to 12 months is that many of the widely held kind of consensus views have been wrong. That's true mm -hmm. in the macro environment. That's true in crypto. And so having uh, kind of you constantly question why is something happening, I think is uh, incredibly important. And, you know, they may not like it, but the legacy system getting questioned uh, by you as well. Uh, well is, here, is here's good. the thing, Pomp, and I think you know this is true. I know that was said tongue in cheek, but I actually think that a lot of what I say is mainstream. People are just too afraid to pipe up. So I, I, th I think that we'll that really is actually more true than people will admit is that uh, I've, I've seen it. Like you've tweeted some things and somebody sent me a tweet or something and they're like, he nailed it. And I'm always <laughs> like, why don't you just respond with, you yeah, nailed it. And like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, so, we associate with that. Yeah. It's a little too hot, a little too hot. <laughs> the internet, it, it doesn't forget. It doesn't forget. Um, awesome, man. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to come on here. We'll definitely do it again in the future. Thanks, Pop. All right, Take see care, you later. Man. I really enjoyed that conversation with Ryan, and I hope that you guys enjoy it as well. Don't forget that these episodes are brought to you by FTX US. You can go click on the link in the description. FTX has super cheap trading fees, sometimes as much as 85% cheaper than their competitors. They also are now offering digital stocks, which allow you to go buy stocks in their beta testing, and it will give you no transaction fees and also no payment for order flow. That is some great pricing. Go check out FTX US today. Click on the link in the description to get started. Hope you enjoy this episode and I'll see you at the next one.